end this morning in a few minutes making that point. But educate yourself, both from the defenders of the King James and the opponents of the King James, both the promoters of the new translations and the opponents of the new translations, and then you make judgments about them. Let me make judgments of three of them. The NIV probably is the easiest target. Many churches are rethinking their use of the NIV today because of the philosophy of translation. It uses the wrong philosophy. It's also based on the wrong text. And there are so many changes in each new edition that when you pick up an NIV, you need to look at the date in which it was published because it's probably, it probably has thousands of changes from the one that was published just two or three years prior to that, beginning all the way in 1973, all the way up to 2011, and how many different uh, versions of the NIV are there available today. And now it's gender neutral. It's an easy target. You don't want the NIV as your church's Bible translation. The ESV is the version that many churches are going to now, the English Standard Version. That's the version that Leland Riken served on the Style Committee, or the Translation Committee, emphasizing style. Leland Riken is a champion of literal equivalence. The ESV is a literal equivalent Bible, as is the King James Version of the Bible, but the ESV is based on the wrong text. It's not the majority ecclesiastical received text. And though I had high hopes for the ESV, if not simply for a Bible to study, because it doesn't use the proper text, I don't think it's an acceptable possible consideration. I can also mention that it was first published in 2003 with revisions in 2007 and another revision in 2011, and they don't tell you what was changed from one edition to another. That's distressing. We want a Bible that doesn't change between my generation and my children's and their and their children. I can also mention something about the New King James. The New King James. I'm going to say something that's very hypothetical now, and that is that if I were ever pressed to vote today, if, and I'm not, for a new translation of the Bible for our churches, and were required to give up this, the King James, perhaps because no one publishes it anymore, they do, but this is the big if, I would probably say among all of these translations, the King James wannabes, the one that rises to the top is probably the earliest one, and that's the New King James Version of the Bible. It's based on the right text. It has the proper philosophy of translation, literal equivalence, and it's very similar to the King James. But read the criticisms. The Trinitarian Bible Society has a nice pamphlet that criticizes the New King James. Educate yourself. And then with the qualifications and cautions that you know, make your judgment. Is it useful in any respect? But you should know about that translation. This, number one, it's not fully based on the Textus Receptus. I said it was. It mostly is. But it also is using the critical text. Which reading of the original Greek should we adopt? And based on what they make their decision. Second, you ought to know about that translation is that it's not simply an updating of the language of the King James, but quite an extensive modernizing, and in my judgment, too often unnecessary. Don't need to do that. And more serious in my mind and greatly disappointing is that it also has more than one edition. I never knew that until this summer. The New King James that came out in 1978 was reprinted in later years. And in those later years, there are a number of changes. 
And so also with that translation, we need to know which edition do I have? 1978, 1984, 2000, what? We need a Bible that is stable, stable. If, and here's another hypothetical situation, we were to make another translation of the Bible, and if I were to vote to do that, it would be simply because there are, in the King James translation, places that are difficult to understand, and not because it's the language of the Bible, but because it's archaic. There are times and places where the word order and the language is archaic. And I do not want my children stum stumbling and my grandchildren over anything that ought to be understood by the first reading of it. Old words and old expressions that if you find a dictionary or some other study helps, you can figure out what they mean. But it's my judgment that that's not what the Bible ought to have. If we have another translation of the Bible, let it be based on the right text. Let it be based on the right philosophy of translation. Let it be done by the church and for the church, free from commercial and monetary motive. I can say a par parenthetical remark here. How many Bible versions today are not driven by commerce, by a desire of a publisher to make money? And then how does that skew the judgments of the general editors of these translations? And if we have another translation, let it be done by translators fully qualified both intellectually and spiritually, men who are orthodox, and let them take as much time as is necessary to have a translation that is in our day as quality as this was in its day. And now you say, why, now you understand why I say, over the course of study, what little faint in the back of my mind thoughts that perhaps we could have another translation that improves on this. Do we really want to take the energy and try to find the time and the money to do that? God has given to the church a Bible that's useful. God has given to the church a Bible that's clear generally. God has given to the church a Bible that's stable in so many respects, a Bible that's trustworthy, a Bible that even in its archaic language that needs to be looked up in an old English dictionary is nevertheless a Bible that gives us the Word of God. And I want a Bible that I can give to my children and grandchildren and say, this Bible is going to be around for a long, long time. What I memorize, you will memorize. And what you memorize, your children will memorize. And you may be sure this is the Word of God. Let me illustrate that by telling a little story about my use of the Bible. About 20 years ago, I didn't know it was that long when I gave this speech previously, but I figured it out, I think it was in 1990, I was in Redlands for a young people's convention with my already then somewhat old Thompson Chain Reference King James Bible. I used it in the pulpit, I used it in catechism, and I wanted to keep using it for the rest of my ministry because like probably some of you, you might not remember the verse reference, but you know it's in the top right corner of this page in this book of the Bible. And I didn't want to get another Thompson because the new editions have the verses on the other pages, whatever you may think of that. I wanted to, to keep this Bible. And so I found a book binder in Mentone, just east of Redlands, that would bind this Bible and would put a good quality leather binding on it for, yes, $100. And I swallowed hard 
and paid him $100 to put that binding on. I love the binding. It's supple. It opens up easily. It lies open nicely. And even in 20 years of use on the pulpit every week and in seminary every day and in catechism all of the time in my study, the silver gold writing isn't even worn off. And you can hardly tell that it's used. He said to me, that book binder, you use that every day for the rest of your life, this was 20 years ago, and it will last a hundred years. That binding will not wear out. And that's why I paid him a hundred dollars, because that's the kind of Bible I want to have. And that's what I want to give to my children, a Bible that will last them a hundred years, and they don't need to worry about it being replaced next year, and then maybe in five years from then, and five years again after that, we need a Bible that lasts. You have a good translation of the Word of God. Now, let's use it. Let's use it. Let's read it. Let's read it every day. Let's meditate on it. Let's memorize it. Let's ponder it. Let's say about it what the psalmist said about it and what we have been singing about it from Psalm 119. Oh, how love I thy law, the Bible. It is my meditation day and night. Its words are sweeter to my mouth than honey, to be desired above honeycomb. And all the rubies of the world could not be given to me to take this book, the Bible, out of my hands. I love the Word of God. Thank you.